Hey guys, welcome to the Smoker Builder Podcast. My name is Frank Cox. I'm the barbecue engineer. And today we're going to be talking about insulation for smokers. Stay tuned. Hey guys, glad you made it back. Um, so today we're going to follow up kind of in a similar topic to what we talked about on the last podcast which was material thickness, like steel thickness for smokers. If you didn't catch that episode, uh, it was the last episode. So binge listen and hear them all. But anyway, um, you know, I posted about it in Smoker Builder U. That's our online community. Uh, it's free to join, smokerbuilderu.com. Anyway, I posted about that in there, and there's been quite a bit of conversation since then about insulation for their smokers. So, you know, uh, I figured I might as well go ahead and cover this one too. You know, I've built pits since 2007, and the very first pit I ever insulated, I believe, was in 2011. Um, I built a pit and uh, put an insulated firebox on it. And, you know, I I was really big into reverse flows at that time. And, uh, you know, let me just kind of cover it, I think the best in a couple, in like a couple of, I didn't write any of this down just so you know, I'm doing this off the cuff. So, uh, I'm going to try to make it as legible as possible with bullet points and stuff. And, uh, so anyway, <clears throat> let's cover it in like three different topics. Um, but before I go into that, I'll finish what I was saying about that first smoker. You know, I, I really liked the fact that when I built that smoker and insulated the firebox, it would rain and that firebox, like you, it wouldn't even, it wouldn't mess with the temperature at all on the pit. However, there was a pretty good downside, uh, to that insulation. I had to run a much smaller fire to keep my temperature down at a lower temp. Now, geographically here, I'm in the middle of Missouri and they always say, if you don't like the weather, stick around for about 30 minutes and, uh, you know, you'll get yours. And uh, that's kind of the way it is down here. We have we have a full four seasons, but I actually would probably feel comfortable dividing it up into two or, th or three more. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we get it all. Uh, high winds, low winds, high temperatures, low temperatures, you know, really seasonal times of the year. Rain, sleet, snow, you know, we get it all. Um and, you know, it's it's really for bad weather around here. We don't have like polar Arctic temperatures, right? So let's hit that first bullet point that's going to get me into that is why insulate, okay? So one big reason that I would say to insulate is uh, like if you, if you have a majority of your seasons are in climate, like, you know, like they're inclement or however you say that word, like your majority of your year, you have ice and snow actively falling from the air. You have really, really cold temperatures like, you know, minus 30, you know, and that kind of stuff happening regularly. Um, you know, those kind of things. That would be one reason to insulate is that a majority of your time is spent with super cold temps. But I think even in that situation, my personal preference would be not to. But let's hit that second topic. The second reason to insulate um, is little hands. That's what we always said, little hands. So if you have a lot of youngins running around, let's say you're cooking for your church or community events or something like that, and uh, all the dads are sitting there around the grill and they got, you know, a couple four and five-year-olds or something like that, you know, and even younger, and they want to touch it for some reason, the bad things is what all the kids want to either put in their mouth or touch, you know? And so, uh, having had a couple of children, I did insulate a few of my pits and, uh, I didn't insulate the pit fully though, but it's just like that little bit of insurance policy there that it's still going to be a little bit hot, but, uh, it's not going to burn them really bad. That's another good reason to insulate. Um, the third reason that I would put under why insulate is because you want a really fancy paint job and you need to protect that paint. So there's, it's no secret in the pit building world, we're cursed with high temperatures that do not, you know, paints that do not like high temperatures. Even the high temperature paints are hard to get along with. So 
Um, for instance, I've always, always said to use Rust-Oleum high heat paint. And uh, you're guaranteed that you're going to get at least a year out of it, you know. Um, you're going to have to reply, uh, reapply that paint as well at some point if you want to keep a prime looking pit. So the catch is that, um, you know, it, if you put automotive paint on there, it's going to turn brown and blue or whatever opposite of what it is right now and uh, green maybe and start to bubble and uh, look bad. Now, I'll tell you this is that I don't mind that myself. If I wanted to paint something up pretty, I'd just roll with it and not worry about the insulation part of it and just let the paint wear. I mean, this is a smoker. It's supposed to do that. It's supposed to look cool. As a matter of fact, I think even some of these big boys that are doing that, like Moberg and them, you know, they do fully insulate their, their smokers on the fireboxes for those pretty paint jobs and stuff, but some guys let it go. They don't care. So... Those are about three reasons why I would insulate. So now, because I'm taking a scientific approach to this, let's talk about why not to insulate. How about that one? So uh, this is going to get more into my personal tastes on this part of it here. So we'll divide it up into a couple of three reasons as well. Let's see if I can hit three reasons off the top of my head. Reason number one is because I want to be able to build a bigger fire, okay? Now, why would I want to build a bigger fire? Um, if you look at a lot of the, you know, let's just talk about top Texas top 50 restaurants. They're kind of the, they're kind of the barometer in the barbecue industry anymore for like what great barbecue is. You know, they're the guys that are, that are putting a huge influence on the industry. Um, guys like Aaron Franklin and and uh, Goldie's for sure. I think they were number one for a while. Um, Ernest down at the Burnt Bean, stuff like that. Soul Belly in Vegas. Um, all those guys, you know, they're really doing a great job with their barbecue. And, um, you know, why is it? Well, you know, they kind of break the rules a little bit with our original calculations on fireboxes. They make them smaller than I said they had to be for reverse flows, which smaller is not wrong um, on offsets, just so you know. Um, they're, they're burning a lot more wood, um, much bigger stacks. You know, they're trying to get a heavier draw, more airflow through the pit, um, those kind of things. And the real reason is is because, you know, they want to be able to get a lot of smoke and flavor and, and you know, get that real good bark texture that you get from, from higher airflows with bigger fires and what, I, what we're calling a dirtier fire. Um, so that term dirtier fire in air quotes to quantify that is not white smoke or gray smoke. Um, or black smoke or whatever other color you can put at it, like maybe a yellow green. That sounds real nasty. Um, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about uh, more of a thin blue smoke, okay? And that blue is heavier than, than we would have on a reverse flow. So when we design reverse flows, we're designing for efficiency on cook chamber temperatures, um, the drop left to right and vertically. Um, we don't want to have to pull meat off and move it around. You know, we want to be able to literally set that thing and, and forget it, um, pretty much and just come out and feed it a stick of wood every 45 minutes on the, on the dot. Um, having a pit like that, we're going to be almost clear on the smoke, like maybe a thin wispy blue to, but it's mostly going to be clear. And so with that, that increase in combustion efficiency, you're going to lose a lot of that flavor that you would have gotten from, uh, sorry, I got to fix something here real quick, from uh, what you would have normally gotten from that, you know, bluer smoke. So if we go, if we, uh, if we run dirtier fire, you know, or um, a more, we have to be able to throw more wood on the pile you know, uh, keep our coal beds spread out a little bit more so we get more surface area, um, run more air through the pit. So we're leaving the door open, literally, for uh, for our air inlet on some situations. The first pit I ever built like that was for a guy named Travis uh, here in town and as a thousand gallon. And I tried to talk him out of it, I'll be honest with you, because we had never done that, 
approach. And the uh, best thing I ever did is do what he said. I'll be honest with you, because it changed the way that I look at uh, burning fires on pits. So on my bingo pit that I recently built, I did a, pretty much my spin, you know, version 2.0 on that approach and mimicked what some of these other pit builders are doing um, with with that. And I got to tell you, it's a huge difference. So saying all of that, if in fact you insulate a firebox, you will not be able to run that bigger wood fire, right? You will lose out on a lot of that quote unquote dirty fire. Matter of fact, I want to say that I think I heard Jeremy Yoder did a podcast recently about it or a YouTube video or something, and he called it a dirty fire. Um, I don't remember if I've seen it or not, but I do remember that coming up in conversation. So uh, anyway, that's that's just kind of my approach to it. Um, I do know that like if I if it's a colder if it's colder entering air temp into the firebox, throw another log on. It's not a big deal. But let's talk about that. That's that's another thing I didn't bring up earlier. People really do have this uh, idea that it'll save them wood um, on on running their pit if they insulate their smoker. And you know, I build these Legend offset smokers. They're a production offset. It's a three sixteenths wall, uninsulated firebox, and uh, um, they're a production pit. You know, they're heavy for production pit on uh, like a barbecue store level. And anyway, uh, 24 by 48, I burn, I mean, you could weigh the wood probably and come up with an exact weight depending on the moisture content and all of that. But the average split that I use in there will be probably two, maybe you know, three possibly to get started, but I generally put two splits on about every 30 to 45 minutes. And those fists are what, or those uh, splits are what I call fist size. So they're about three inches around and about 12 inches long. Now, when I run bingo, once I get it up to temp, it takes a little more wood to get to temp. But once it gets to temp, I'm not putting much more wood than that on that big old pit. That's a 300 and something gallon cook chamber. And uh, I'm only putting like maybe three splits a little bit bigger than that, you know? So it's not like we're burning a cord of wood in one pit and a half a cord in another. Like that's that's not the kind of wood consumption we're talking about here. It's It's primarily a lot less wood than most people think when the pit is designed correctly. So let me think of another reason that I wouldn't insulate. So we all like that patina now these days. Um, another reason I would not insulate and a big reason why I did not do it on bingo besides the, the bigger fire is because I didn't, uh, I wanted to get that blue color on the firebox. I, I wanted that natural patina, you know, heating up and, and, uh, you know, heating up on that firebox and getting that color, the blues and all of that. And man, it looks super cool. Um, you rub that down with oil and it, and it just gets better with time. It, it really does. Um, sometimes it'll get darker and browner and all kinds of stuff. So that's pretty cool. If you're looking for that vintage patina look, you know, um, let's see, why else would I not insulate my firebox. I'm having a hard time coming up with a third reason, I'll be honest with you. Well, save material. <laughs> How about that one? Save material. Let's say that. Okay, that's our third reason. So basically, uh, it depends on what thickness of material you're using as well. I mean, you could do two walls of three eighths inch thick plate if you want. I think that is ridiculous. And I wouldn't do that unless the three eighths plate was cheaper than quarter for some reason, which it happens. Um, but, uh, you know, typically when I insulate a firebox, at least on the plans, when we show you on our plans at smokerplans.net, these are designs that you can get and uh, build your own smoker. If you buy a set of those plans, I'm telling you to use quarter inch inside and out because basically structurally, it's actually easier to build it that way. And that's a real good medium. It's going to outlast thinner material. Um, you know, but I've seen guys use 10 gauge for an insulated firebox, which is only an eighth of an inch thick. But 
you know, basically you got to build an inside wall and then you got to have the insulation and then you got to build an outside wall. You could also use a piece of pipe. I know there's somebody out there that just said, you ought to just use some pipe. You know, it's a lot easier. You can totally do that as well. Doesn't really, I mean, if you go to pipe in bigger diameters, 24 inches and plus, that's why three eighths is the, is a number that comes up all the time. Because pipe yards, you know, they won't, 24-inch pipe is not desirable in quarter-inch wall or thinner because sitting in the pipe yard at egg shapes, um, you got a bunch of pipe stacked on top of it and the trucking and the forklifts and all of that stuff, it literally egg shapes or gets dense in it a lot easier than 3 8 So the standard uh, for what's called Schedule 40 is actually closer to 3 8 of an inch thick on the wall thickness. So if you do like 24 inch and bigger for a firebox, you're going to have a lot more material weight, you know, which we all found out on the last podcast when we talked about steel thicknesses, we're usually paying per pound for steel thickness. So anyway, I made it through. I made three points for why to insulate and why to not insulate. I'll let you make up your own mind how you feel about it, but I'll just kind of wrap this up with my personal conclusion on how I like to do it. Um, I'm, I'm really, really, really into more of the traditional, you know, authentic wood fired, let's work for it. Not really worried about production, like making a lot of barbecue really cheap. Um, that's not my concern. Um, I'm in it for the experience and the fun and the, I like to run a fire. I like to mess with it and maintain my pit. And, uh, so I'm always pretty much going to go for that uninsulated deal. I enjoy the challenge. I believe, you know, I'll tell you a story real quick. Something that inspired me one time is talking to a guy named Darren Worth. He's Iowa Smokey D's is his barbecue team. He's out of Iowa there, of course. And he's one of the winningest people ever in barbecue, and he's a good friend. And uh, he's always cooked on a jambo. And matter of fact, I think <laughs> I know he's got a bunch of them, but the ba- the jambo that's on his porch on his trailer, he's been cooking on for a bunch of seasons. And uh, he said to me here, we was at I believe we was at uh, Murfreesboro, Illinois contest down there at. Uh, and um, 7th Street Barbecue, I think it's what it's called. But anyway, uh, he said that he likes it when something messes up because he's cooked so many contests. He's been doing it for so long that it's just not interesting and fun unless something goes wrong. You know, he just has done it like he's mastered it, you know. And so when you get to that point with something, the challenge is a lot of fun. And you know, I'm not going to claim that I've mastered running pits yet. I've done it for a long time and I've ran all different kinds and designed and all that stuff. But I'll tell you this, I sure do like a challenge once in a while. And uh, I believe that an uninsulated pit affords me that, especially when I change designs and test new things. So don't just build a pit one time. That's my advice to you. Build a pit and then build another pit. Because the first pit you build, you're going to have fun building it. Or the first pit you buy, you're going to buy it and run a pit for a while. And uh, don't get married to it. You know, change it up. Do something else. You know, that's that's where the fun part of barbecue is, in my opinion. And I, I hope that you uh, experience that same feeling that I've experienced with it and enjoy it like I do. So... Anyway, guys, I won't keep you no longer. I really appreciate you listening to the podcast. The current run rate as of January 2023, I'm trying to pop one of these out every other day. I might accidentally skip one here and there, but I'm doing them live action right before I publish them. So um, hopefully I can maintain that status. If you don't mind, do me a favor and go over to smokerbuilderu.com. Get on over there and join our community. Let us know that you came in because you heard the podcast. If you're already there, let me know you're listening. And uh, give me ideas, things you want me to talk about. This is one place where you can turn me off if I'm talking. (laughs) You can always hit the stop button if you're tired of listening to me. So anyway, 
Uh, until next time, keep your smoke thin and blue. This is Frank Cox, the barbecue pit engineer and founder of smokerbuilder.com. Hey, I appreciate you. Till next time, take it easy.